dogs. However, I also study therapy dogs and pet dogs and, um, and different applications there as well. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so overview of today's learning objectives and identifying reasons why it's important to be knowledgeable about these different types of dogs. Um, hopefully everyone will be able to articulate the definitions and the protections associated with each type of dog, as well as the regulations that exist specifically here on CSU campus. Um, developing an understanding of how to interact appropriately with a service animal and the handler is another lear learning objective. What can you ask? What can you not ask? And we're going to end with talking about um, service dog fraud or a fraudulent behavior surrounding this field and why that might be harmful and uh, microaggressions as, as they relate to service and assistance dogs. Okay, so uh, of course it's not a secret that opportunities for dogs to work in specific roles to he to improve human health and well-being are rapidly increasing. As you can see from these pictures illustrating different dog roles ranging from uh, medical alerts such as diabetic alert dogs to therapy dogs visiting nursing homes in hospitals to uh, emotional support dogs and of course service dogs. And it's important that mental health providers, disability advocates, and policymakers, and every member of the general public to be educated about the differences between these terms. Um, and the reason why this is important to understand really the differences between these terms um, in, in, in the detailed ways is a, a really a matter of equity inclusion for individuals with disabilities. Service dogs are a form of assistance that is imperative to individuals, and it's important to create an equitable work and school environment for them. Um, in addition, in order to ensure a diverse student body and staff, um, it's really up to the university to uh, recognize these barriers, um, one of which is miseducation surrounding service dogs. So that is the goal of today. Um, it's also, of course, a policy issue, both um, with local laws, state laws, and federal laws. And then it's lastly important for just being an informed public citizen and promoting positive interactions. Um, this is a matter of uh, respect and, and inclusion, and um, really everyone in this room is going to see one of these dogs working or be exposed to one of these three types of dogs at some point in their life. And understanding how they differ and knowing how to act around these types of dogs is really important for uh, being um, a publicly informed citizen. Okay, so what's the difference? So let's start off with uh, a quick definitions for each of them. So um, first off, therapy dogs. Therapy dogs provide comfort to individuals in different medical, residential, or academic settings. I like to use the um, the relationship that this is a one-to-many type of relationship where one therapy dog is providing comfort to many, many individuals. A therapy dog is someone's own pet dog that the person has had uh, qualified and certified uh, largely through a service dog or sorry a therapy dog organization or agency and this therapy animal team which is the dog and their handler volunteers their time to make visits to hospitals schools nursing homes etc um, and uh, sometimes healthcare professionals such as counselors might be the handler of the therapy dog where they're bringing their own pet dog in um, that has uh, selected and training for therapy dogs to come in to help them with their practice. So um, we'll talk a bit about therapy dogs in a second. Um, and I'm gonna go, to go through these in more detail, but just quick definitions for now. Definitions for emotional support dogs um, and emotional support animals in general are medically prescribed animals that provide therapeutic benefits through their dedicated companionship. They're also considered pet dogs with the key difference that they are prescribed by a mental health professional for a patient with a diagnosed psychological or emotional disorder such as anxiety disorder, uh, major depression, panic attacks, phobias, etc. Through the dog's companionship, the dog eases anxiety and depression and loneliness. Um, however, the dog is not trained to do that. They simply are uh, therapeutic in their support and their presence. 
And then service dogs. Um, service dogs are trained for specific work or tasks that help an individual with a disability. With a disability. So um, there's a really wide range of work and tasks that this could be. And some dogs are, of course, trained to lead a person with a vision impairment, some uh, to pick up dropped items, some to alert and respond to a seizure. There's a lot of applications here. Um, and, and these dogs are uh, potentially the, the highest level of training when we consider the spectrum uh, of these types of dogs. Okay, so what is the difference? So I have this table here and I thought that we would just kind of go through it. Usually I do this in person and we're able to um, like raise our hands and, and vote and, and be more interactive, but um, I didn't quite set up the polling features today. So what I'm going to do is um, just kind of pause at each one and I would love you guys to just kind of check your own knowledge um, and see what you think and then I'll show the correct answer. Um, Hopefully you're right, and if not, um, I hope that you learned something today. Um, I find that even if someone thinks that they definitely are able to do this table um, and they know all the differences, that they still will learn something. Um, in fact, I still continue to be educated uh, myself on, on different issues as well as policy is always changing um, and, and, and things are always changing. So. Um, okay, so first one probably is the easiest. Who of these three types of animals um, has full public access into restaurants and stores? So I'll give a second to think about that. Okay, so if you said only service dogs, you're correct. Um, so service dogs are protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is a federal law that allows individuals with disabilities to have reasonable accommodations in public. The service dog um, is one of those assistive aids that is allowed anywhere that the handler is allowed. Um, so public access spaces here, um, including restaurants, um, public transportation, uh, stores, etc. Okay, next one, who can travel on commercial airlines? This one um, is one of those ones that I was saying is, is, is always changing. Okay, so emotional support and service are correct. Um, however, I would love to kind of go over how things have been working in this space. So everyone knows the story of the emotional support peacocks and the emotional support um, alligators and um, all of the, the drama surrounding that. Um, and if you're not aware, all of those rules changed. Um, the Department of um, uh, Justice is the one that is involved in these kind of uh, airline rules, which is um, what governs the, the space up in airplanes, which is different than the public space on the ground. Um, and so in December 2020, they uh, proposed these new guidelines, which went into effect in early 2021. And the rules are now that uh, service dogs are still protected on flights. They can still uh, travel um, free of cost with their handler. But emotional support animals can only be dogs or cats now. So um, it's really uh, just those two species and it's up to individual airlines to um, state whether or not they will allow those dogs and cats to fly as emotional support animals um, or if they are just allowing pets um, under a certain weight to be flying. So um, as of now, um, to my best knowledge, uh, the, the major airlines that we all uh, tend to fly on, United, American, Delta, um, Southwest, Frontier, um, all do not allow emotional support animals anymore. Um, there are some airlines that still do. I don't think this list is exhaustive by any means. I just put in there four airlines that I know do still allow um, emotional support animals with regulations. So I put an asterisk there because it depends on the airline. Um, the laws that govern this is called the Air Carrier Access Act. I'm sorry, I have a question about this. Sure. Um, so is this mean that people can travel with these animals without charge? Or is it the idea that, because I know that there are some airlines that you can pay money for non-therapy service or emotional support animals to ride on. 
Yes, exactly. Great question. Um, so yeah, pets have always been able to fly if they're under a certain weight. So you can bring your small dog or your cat on a flight with a charge. Um, so that's always been the case and that's still the case. Um, the emotional support animals and the service animals um, are not charged and that is because of disability access, right? Um, it's a reasonable accommodation that they need to have with them. And that was what was happening in the field was, you know, I have this emotional support animal with me. I'm not paying, you know, a fee um, for them to fly with me. So yeah, the, the ones in green are airlines that are still recognizing that emotional support animals um, are, are necessary to be with their handler um, and not charged to be with their handler. Um, however, all of the ones in red um, now are just, you know, back to service dogs can still fly with their handler um, without being charged and pets can still fly with a charge if they're under a certain weight. Does that help make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, who can live in housing that does not allow pets? So this one is most important service as well. Um, this is governed by the Fair Housing Act, uh, the Equal Housing Opportunity, uh, which allows the most support animals to live with their handlers in, um, in areas that otherwise would not allow pets. Um, so no pets housing, uh, most support animals can live there as well as service animals as well. We'll talk about a little bit about that later, about how that translates to campus. Okay, my favorite one to talk about, um, who must be registered or certified? Service and therapy. Oh, sorry, I'm unmuted. Oh. No, I would love it. I'm down for people to shout it out. Um, actually, no, uh, service dogs are not registered or certified, neither really emotional support animals. Um, the only ones that uh, do this are therapy animals, but I put an asterisk here um, because it's not a federal law. It's just a, a recognized uh, supported thing that we, that we certify therapy animals. So why is that? So let's talk about therapy animals first. So um, there are a lot of organizations that uh, certify therapy animals. There's a lot of national organizations that do this countrywide. Um, Pet Partners has 11,000 uh, therapy animal teams, I believe. Um, AKC Therapy Dog Program is another big one. Therapy Dogs International, Alliance of Therapy Dogs. And the goal of this is it, these are pet dogs and um, their, their handlers are volunteers. So there is training required to not only um, educate the handler about um, making sure that they're aware of their dog's body language and stress signals and um, different types of uh, behaviors surrounding what happens when you go into a school or a nursing home with your dog. Um, but there also needs to be some sort of um, liability in place where we're, we're testing essentially that the therapy dog is um, not uh, jumping or has an aggression or is um, to basically are they appropriate to visit some of these areas. So we tend to do um, certifications with therapy dogs um, for for these reasons. Um, I highlighted the international, or so the national ones here, but in every state and city, there's always local organizations that certify therapy dogs. Um, of course, I'm from Havoc, which if you are not aware, is the campus, um, a nonprofit organization that certifies therapy dogs. I'll talk about us in a second, um, but there's also a couple others like Colorado Comfort Canines and uh, Professional Therapy Dogs of Colorado. So you go through training as a person and as a dog, um, as a team, um, and then you get certified. Very importantly, not just dogs can be therapy animals. This is the same for therapy cats and therapy guinea pigs and therapy animals of all shapes and sizes. They all um, tend to get certified with these organizations. Okay, so emotional support and service animals. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it would be nice if we had a national registry of, of this, but uh, we don't. So um, there is no official database or registry of service animals um, and service dog owners are not required to ever get any type of certificate and businesses are not al uh, allowed to ask for one. Similarly, there is no centralized test or certification process um, for service animals. 
Um, and unfortunately, fake service dog registries do exist, and many pet owners fall victim to um, these, believing that they um, need to certify their service dog um, as a federal guideline. Um, and although there are numerous websites offering to certify or register service dogs um, or emotional support dogs for a very hefty price, um, these services are not required under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and so getting a certificate or a, a vest or an ID card does not make a dog a service dog. Um, however, I want to point out that not all of these registries are fraudulent scams. Some of these have very well-meaning intentions um, where they're trying to solve this problem of fake service dogs. But unfortunately, it's very hard for the average person to figure out which of these, um, these uh, registrations that really look and sound identical to each other are well-meaning and which will be taking their money. So um, it's a big problem. Um, and what you'll see is when you, you go to these websites, um, you can you can pay for this registration package, um, which is, is discounted from 150. Now it's only $109 um, and you can even add on, I need, a, I need a letter with this as well. So um, unfortunately, this is just a matter of education. Um, people don't know that they don't need this um, and they don't know where to find the resources to help them. Um, if they do want to train their own service dog, what does that entail? What does it uh, require to, to make my pet into a service dog? Um, and, and it does not require buying this registration package. Um, so happy to talk about that um, either now or, or later, um, but that is probably the, the biggest one that has public misconception. Along with that, you know, we just talked about these ID cards um, and it really there's no um, federal law um, that requires any service or emotional support dog like when they're actually um, in public to uh, carry identification. Um, I have an asterisk here for therapy dogs because a lot of our therapy dogs do. This is because they're entering places like hospitals and it's really helpful for the hospital and nursing home to know that they have um, access there and that they're part of an organization. So you'll a lot of times see little name tags on these dogs. Um, however, it's not a requirement for service dogs to have this. However, I'm not saying that this is not helpful. Um, of course, a lot of the veterans that I study um, carry ID cards with them that say, you know, hi, I'm a service dog. What do I do? And, you know, some some questions and answers. And when they get questions about their service dog, it's so helpful to be able to say, you know, right now he's working and I really just want to, you know, buy my groceries. But here's a card explaining what he is and, and what he does for me. Um, so those cards are really helpful for a lot of people um, and they're helpful for a lot of different reasons. Um, sometimes, for example, um, having information on the dog about um, the person's medical condition or what to do in case of an emergency is really helpful. Um, but what I'm saying here is that according to the law, you do not need to care identification. Okay. Uh, who must wear a vest when working? So I'll give everyone a second to think about that. All right, the answer is no one. Um, however, of course, most handlers choose to have an identifying harness or vest on their dogs um, for service dogs to alert the public that they're working. Um, however, according to the law, no service dog is ever required to wear anything. So even if a service dog is not wearing a vest or a harness, it does not mean that they are not a real service dog. There's um, some handlers that do not um, have a vest. Um, this is, you know, an equity issue. Um, however, um, I would say 99% of, of service animals do like to have something identifying on, which is very helpful to uh, individuals to alert that they're working. Um, our therapy dogs sometimes wear vests, sometimes wear bandanas, um, something to identify that uh, they can be pet um, and, and no sort of vests um, are required for emotional support animals, for example, when they are flying. So um, not required by law, but sometimes still very helpful. Okay. Um, who must be professionally trained? Um, and I'm referring to this as um, needing to be trained by a dog trainer with a certain title or certification. Okay. 
So the answer is not any of the categories. It might be surprising. So, um, uh, like as I mentioned, therapy dogs are, are usually pet dogs that are being volunteered with their time. Um, they do have to be trained for obedience and they have to be screened for not being aggressive or not uh, jumping up on people, but um, their owner can do that uh, training very easily. Uh, here at Habic, um, we help pet owners uh, train their therapy dogs uh, as part of our program. Uh, emotional support dogs are, are not trained for any task, so that one is a no. And then service dogs um, a lot of times are trained by nonprofit organizations, which have dog trainers on staff. Um, these nonprofit organizations uh, place service dogs free of cost to individuals. Um, some organizations might require the individual to fundraise the cost. Um, and there are some private service dog trainer options as well. But importantly, service dogs can be self-trained. Um, you can uh, have a pet dog that you want to train as a service dog, um, and that is still a very valid avenue. Um, that is really important for uh, access. And so it's, um, imagine someone who doesn't have the funds um, to be able to hire someone to, to train or um, uh, doesn't want to wait on a wait list for several years to get a service dog. It's important to have an option that someone could train their own pet dog. Um, another reason for this is because a lot of service dogs um, tend to be trained for really individual types of tasks um, and that self-training or private training uh, is important um, to make sure that we're having service dogs that are really um, tailored for the needs of their handler. So um, that's one thing that I think people think service dogs only come from organizations, but um, it is very valid to train your own service dog as well. Okay, and then who must abide by behavior temperament standards? Um, and this is everyone. So I already mentioned um, aggression, disruptive behavior problems, um, urinating or defecating. Um, these are all standards that all three of them have to um, exhibit. Um, they can be asked to leave, a therapy dog can be asked to leave a nursing home if they are being disruptive. An emotional support dog can be asked um, to, uh, to leave um, a housing situation. Service dogs can be asked to leave any business um, if they are being disruptive, if they are not house trained, or if they are aggressive. So that's important for all three. Okay, last one is um, restrictions on species. So. Um, dogs versus other animals. Okay, so all three of them have restrictions. Um, does anyone know um, there's nine species of therapy animal that the largest organization certifies? Does anyone want to shout out what they think the nine might be? Starting off with obvious ones. Okay, no one. Or put Harry, in the in the chat. I see oh, there's some responses coming in. There's let's see, mini horse, pit bull, ferret, yep. bird, dogs, cats, rabbits, guinea pigs. Yeah, yeah. I love cats, the guinea pigs. Ponies, rats, snakes, lizards, horses, goats. Yeah, we've gotten, I think, eight out of the nine, but there's still one that no one has said so far. And it's the one that I think, it's pretty rare, but it's it's emerging. Um, so I'll just tell you guys what it is. It is, hold on, let me get rid of the chat. Okay, uh, cat, dog, bird, guinea pig, rat rabbit, pig, horses. And the one that no one got was llama slash alpaca. Um, I think alpaca is the one that really is the the, the most prominent here. Llamas um, can be a little aggressive, as you guys know. Um, and they're not very frequent, but they are one of the nine species that Pet Partners registers. So you learn something new every day. By far, dogs are the most popular, followed by cats. And then, uh, of course, we have a lot of amazing therapy horses as well. Um, importantly, um, pet partners, for example, is, is what I'm using. Um, they're the largest um, uh, registry 
of, of therapy animals in the country with that 11,000 number, um, they have a hard no on any exotic animals um, and reptiles, including snakes um, and lizards and, and ferrets, as well as farm animals, uh, including chickens, ducks, and goats, due to um, diseases that they might carry with the, the lizards and reptiles. I think that's the, the biggest concern, but I'm not sure about that I'm not really a lizard person, but one of the biggest reason is because we can't really evaluate their predictability and reaction to stress. Um, so that's really important. We have to make sure that the animal is, uh, of course, not experiencing any stress and that we are uh, training the handler in looking for stress signals and um, indicators that the animal is not consenting to the interaction or is not enjoying the interaction. And it's very hard to do that with um, animals that we don't have uh, good uh, physical indicators of their stress. Um, so that is the reason why those animals are not uh, registered and certified. Um, however, I know that those do exist um, and it really is just up to the handler to make sure that that animal is not stressed and is enjoying the interaction um, if it is a snake or a chicken or um, other type of animal. Very Apologies for interrupting you, but there was a question in the chat oh, yeah. around whether there are any restrictions on dog breeds. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, therapy animals, no restrictions. Um, there are incredible therapy dogs of all different shapes and sizes. Uh, emotional support dogs, I know that there's um, some overlap between breed restrictions and housing, um, and, and different landlords treat that differently. Uh, and service dogs, no breed restrictions as well. Um, and really, this is, this is important for understanding that dogs uh, can be different shapes and sizes. And we're going to talk about that in a second, which I think it's a misconception that a Chihuahua or a Yorkie can't be a service dog. They very much can. Um, and yeah, we have incredible pit bull therapy dogs. Actually, my favorite therapy dogs are all pits. They are the biggest sweethearts on planet Earth. Okay. So um, I just wanted to spend some time now talking about each of the, the areas. Um, and I thought we would start off with talking about therapy dogs, um, which are very good boys and girls. Um, and I'm gonna talk really about uh, HABIC, which is our program here at Colorado State University, because um, that is the most immediate types of therapy dogs that you might see and interact with on campus. Um, so if you weren't aware, um, HABIC is, Human Animal Bond in Colorado, which is a nonprofit um, center within the School of Social Work, and uh, has a tripartite mission, including community engagement by um, certifying therapy dogs and sponsoring them, um, education. So we have um, quite a bit of handler education, community education, and we also teach a certificate in the graduate school about human animal interactions, and then research, which is what I do. Um, I am a, a research fellow with Habic. We look at the effects of, of dogs and the human animal bond on human health and well-being. Um, so our therapy dogs are, are in this arm um, and Havoc trains and uh, sponsors volunteer therapy animal teams all across the front range. We do this by working with volunteers and their pet dogs in the Colorado community um, from Fort Collins all the way down to Denver. And the way that this works is dogs go through medical and behavioral screening to see if they are a good fit for becoming a therapy dog. Um, we then work with them one-on-one -on -one over the course of 12 weeks um, to do that obedience training and uh, different types of training that are really helpful for being a therapy dog. For example, um, how to take a treat from someone's hand really gently, um, how to um, remain sitting or laying down when being pet, um, and different types of things like that. Um, finally, after the team goes through training, um, they go through their uh, evaluation, which is um, uh, done in person where we kind of just make sure that the dog is sound on all of uh, these things, not jumping, barking, um, not having an aggression towards other dogs or people um, and, uh, and different types of things like that. And then when they pass, they get certified. Um, they are certified Havoc Therapy Dog and they uh, get providing uh, ongoing support and mentorship from Havoc as they then go out to the community. 
And um, really importantly, um, we certify all different types of breeds, any shape, size, and color. Um, and we also certify cats. We don't have many therapy cats right now. If you have a cat you think might be a good therapy animal candidate, we would love to hear from you. Um, I think as of now, we have six therapy cats certified and um, over 100 dogs. So uh, very much need more therapy cats in, in our campus. Um, for those of you who have seen Havoc Animals uh, de-stress events and around um, the library um, and were um, every Friday we do therapy animals at Gifford. Every once in a while we have one of our therapy cats and they are a humongous hit. Um, it's, it's really fun to see people interact with therapy cats, um, especially cat people that really, you know, miss their own cat at home and, and really just want to, to pet and interact with the cat. So um, just a shout out for our incredible therapy cats. Um, and really the requirement for being a therapy animal is um, not only for Havoc, but for all is, is loving people. Um, so really um, interacting with uh, different types of people from all different backgrounds and, and really enjoying those interactions, um, as well as coming into new places like a hospital or a nursing home or a library and being um, really calm and, and not stressed, no reactivity or fear, um, and, and really just wanting to be pet. So um, if you have a dog that you are interested in, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, it, we we love all different types of dogs as long as they are loving people and relatively um, behaviorally sound. Okay, so our dogs visit a ton of different settings. I just talked about campus. Dogs, our dogs and cats are on campus all the time. Um, however, the habit animals also visit local hospitals. Um, long-term care facilities, different schools. Um, Havoc animals are in uh, Poudre school districts, different um, senior care, um, mental health organizations like addiction recovery centers and hospice as well. So this is just some examples for, for where therapy animals are making an impact. Um, and uh, Habic has been around for a very long time and as of right now um, is uh, at, in 40 organizations across the front range of Colorado, ranging from schools and hospitals and of course campus as well. Harry? Yeah. Sorry again to interrupt, but this question is around what you're sharing. So the question is, um, how do therapy dogs and cats manage the issue of people who may be allergic? So say they're in an environment such as a nursing home and there are folks who are allergic to dogs, yeah. are, are the dogs still able to go there? Absolutely. So before um, animals are visiting any of these 40 um, organizations we partner with, there is uh, a lot of preparation that goes into that. So there's site visits, there's conversations with the staff and the leadership. Um, if there are any uh, residents or individuals with allergies, then no, the dog does not, um, or dog or cat does not visit them. Or um, there's a lot of precautions made to make sure that animals are not in their wing, for example. Um, that's a very important consideration that goes into that first step. So yeah, there's a lot of paperwork and um, uh, in, in different things that we do to make sure that there's liability in place for the dog and the humans and that everyone is safe and, and consenting to the interactions. That's, that's really important. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So moving on to service dogs, probably the most time we'll spend because there's a lot of things to, to know and understand with these guys. So um, all different types of service animals um, in the United States, we also call them assistance animals. Um, and uh, you might be most familiar with guide dogs that help people with vision impairments. These dogs typically wear a special harness with a handle um, rather than a vest uh, for their handler to grasp while they're walking. Uh, hearing dogs are another type of dog um, that can be trained with people with hearing impairments. When a dog hears a particular cue, they alert the owner and lead them to, towards the noise sometimes. Um, these include smoke or fire alarms, doorbells, door knocking, um, alarm clocks, and, and sometimes even the person's name. 
Mobility types of service dogs help individuals with physical disabilities, and they perform everyday tasks um, such as retrieving objects, uh, opening doors, um, turning on and off lights. Um, these individuals can also provide stability for individuals who struggle with balance. Um, so for those individuals who um, need extra support in standing or sitting um, or bracing, um, they can use the dog for support as well. We have a whole category of medical service dogs. Um, some examples of this are seizure response service dogs that can assist individuals before, during, and after a seizure, um, as well as diabetic alert dogs who can alert their handler to low or high blood sugar. Um, medical service dogs can also be trained to retrieve certain medication or get help at a certain event. And then psychiatric service dogs. Um, these are helped to train individuals with a disability that we call invisible um, and is a mental disorder rather than a physical. Um, so the, probably the two biggest applications of this are service dogs that are trained to help uh, military veterans with PTSD, where they can alert to respond to anxiety episodes, help create public space and crowds, wake up from a nightmare, et cetera. And then another popular psychiatric service dog or autism service dogs, which are trained to help uh, children or adolescents with autism by applying deep pressure, um, sleeping with them, uh, helping to interrupt repetitive behaviors, and providing service in public as well. Um, and I'm sure I missed uh, some type of dog here. I, they're really expanding as we get to know more about um, how we can train dogs to do certain things and how good dogs' noses are. Um, that's That's been something that's really exploded in the diabetic alert and seizure response community. Um, however, what the, the take home message is that there are a lot of different things that a dog can be trained to do. Carrie, one particular question around what service dogs can do that came mm -hmm. in the chat, came through was, um, can service dogs serve individuals with heart conditions? Um, oh, I do not know. I have not heard of that. But like I said, I think that the opportunities for training dogs to do certain tasks are just continuing to expand. I would imagine that they could, like I said, retrieve medication or retrieve help are two of the things that come to mind there. Um, but I, I'm not really um, well educated on, on the potential aspects for cardiac disabilities. That's a good question. Um, okay, so when service dogs are entering the public space, which we talked about, they're protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act to accompany their handler anywhere the handler goes. There are some considerations. Um, if you are a business owner, um, you are required by law to treat individuals with service animals as if they were any other guest. And um, businesses are only legally allowed to ask two questions to an individual. Um, and I would say businesses, but also uh, anyone is only allowed to ask two questions. By law, is the dog a service animal required because of disability, which is a yes or no question? And what work or task has the dog been trained to perform? And they only need to list one thing. So uh, the answer to these two questions is what makes a service dog? So uh, there are no uh, papers or certification or um, proof that this is a service dog. It is just these two questions. And if the handler says yes and describes the worker task, then they are a service dog under federal law and they are allowed to be um, in the public place. Um, I will say that there, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act does specifically exempt some places as, as not being public. This includes private clubs and places of worship, um, including churches, temples, and synagogues and mosques. Um, so places of worship um, are, make their own allowances regarding service animals, but are technically are not covered under federal law. Okay, so we talked about those two questions, um, and it really importantly, um, no one can ever ask about the person's disability. That is um, a breach of of, um, of privacy and inappropriate um, to ask them, what disability do you have? Why do you need this service dog? Um, you cannot ask for documentation, um, and you cannot ask that the dog performs the task or work that they've been trained to do. Um, so the person does not need to prove that the dog can do that task. That's really important as well. 
Um, however, um, businesses and, um, and institutions can ask that the service dog uh, be removed if they are ever disruptive, aggressive, or not housebroken. Establishments that sell or prepare food um, tend to allow service dogs in public areas, um, even if state and local health codes prohibit um, where this federal law applies. This is where things get really messy and gray because um, it's kind of a case by case basis here. And in general, um, service dog handlers, I think, avoid these types of um, situations, um, but technically federal law considers them, them access here. And uh, importantly, um, according to the this law, um, individuals accompanied by a service dog cannot be isolated from others, treated less favorably, or charged fees that are not charged to others. Okay, so service dog considerations in the workplace. So unlike Title III of the Assistance um, American Disabilities Act, which is the public spaces, um, Title I regulates employment and it requires employers to make quote unquote reasonable accommodations for employees with disabilities. So a little bit different in the workplace. So the ADA really leaves up to the employer to determine if um, the reasonable accommodations are necessary and if the service animal um, is, is reasonable in the workplace. And whether or not an accommodation is reasonable will vary according to the position and the context. Um, so how the disability affects their ability to do their job and the environment they work in. For example, it might not be appropriate for a service animal to accompany an individual who works around uh, forklifts or machinery, um, or if they work in an operating room where there's a sterile environment that must be maintained, um, et cetera. Okay, and then moving on to campus, I just want to point out that um, CSU has another own policy surrounding this, uh, which was put into place in October 2016 and uh, revised in 2019 and is available online for anyone to review. It's, it's a really, really great resource. So in accordance to the university's policy on accommodations for individuals with disabilities um, under the OEO, the university accommodates an individual's need for the use of a service dog on campus. A service dog can accompany an individual with disability on campus, um, including classrooms, um, the rec center, campus residents, um, and there's some exceptions to that. Um, on CSU campus, service dogs um, are not allowed in human or animal cadaver labs environments that contain other live animals in any environment that could endanger the service dog um, like forklifts or machinery or, or different types of applications like that. Um, service dogs are not required to be registered, um, but um, all individuals with service dogs are very highly encouraged to reach out to the Disability Center or the OEO um, if you are a student or staff. Um, and this just really helps um, with that public education piece and, and making sure that um, the university knows that you have a service dog accompanying you. And it is encouraged, but again, not required to wear a visible signifier. Um, CSU um, encourages this because it is really helpful to know that this is a service dog, not a pet dog, and that they are working. Um, however, not required. And uh, CSU also puts uh, together suggestions on, on how to interact with service dogs on campus. Um, they should receive the right of way in respect to other pedestrians, cyclists, and skateboarders. And um, please don't ride your bike or skateboard within five feet of a service dog if you do see one, just to respect that they're, their space and um, that they are working. Okay, so what do you do um, or how do you interact with someone who has a service dog? Um, importantly, interact with them just as you would any other person. That is really important. Um, one thing that is probably the most common um, etiquette issue is, is speak to the handler, not the dog. So make eye contact with the handler um, and directly speak to them. Um, it, it tends to be um, a little abrasive and inappropriate when you immediately um, are talking to the dog, um, which leads to also you should not talk to the dog um, uh, to distract them at all. So when they are working, um, it's important that they are allowed to work without distractions, including um, um, not touching, talking to, or feeding. Um, sometimes a handler will say, you know, you can pet my dog. If they allow that, you can do that. But um, always don't assume that that is the case. 
Um, if they're far away, refrain from staring or pointing or taking pictures. This is really, really hard, especially for children. And, um, you know, even uh, the average person, you see this beautiful service dog, you want to look at them, you want to, um, you know, pay attention to them. However, um, that's not great for the handler. Um, a lot of my veterans that I work with, with PTSD service dogs, um, when I ask them what's the drawbacks of having a service dog, it's the stares and the points. And um, for their disability, which is um, post-traumatic stress, which has a range of implications for how comfortable and uncomfortable they feel in public, um, being stared at and pointed at, and especially um, children um, pointing at them and, and yelling like, look at that dog, really um, adds to their anxiety and is a, a big trigger and a problem for them. So um, it's important to, to know how to interact with this and then also to educate your children and your peers about, um, about how to interact with a, a service dog from a distance. Importantly, if you have your own dog, do not allow it to approach a working service dog. And um, there's a, a microaggressions that I think that we need to be aware of. Sometimes these are made out of, um, you know, uh, positive feelings and implications. They're, they're not being said to hurt uh, the handler's feelings or to be inappropriate. Um, they're often out of, a, you know, a very genuine place. However, it's important for us to step back and think about how that could be a microaggression. Um, saying things like, um, you know, I'm not supposed to pet your dog, but oh my gosh, your dog is so cute. And especially things like, oh, I wish I could bring my dog places with me. Um, sometimes dogs uh, in working roles wear special uh, foot protection to protect their paws and saying things like, oh my gosh, look how adorable his little shoes are. Um, all of those things tend to undermine the really important role that these dogs are playing for individuals. Um, and th the issue here is that for handlers, their service dogs is not a fun thing um, or, you know, an accessory, um, or something like, you know, a cute shirt or cute shoes. Um, there's something that a disabled individual must, um, must need for their daily interactions. They can't just, you know, not interact um, with people without the service dog present. They're an everyday 24 hour tool to help that person get as close to normal as they can. And oftentimes the way that the public is interacting with these dogs can undermine that feeling of normalcy and actually hurt more than help. So just some things to kind of check yourself when you um, see a service dog or interact with the person. Um, just, you know, try to interact with them as if the dog was in there, uh, speak to the handler and be respectful. And that's really all that service dog handlers want you to know. Um, okay, yeah. Um, on the topic of service dogs, so another question came through um, regarding, so the question was, how does it work if a student is allergic to dogs and someone in their class has a service oh. dog? Yeah, um, so there on that website of the uh, CSU policy, there's really great language surrounding this about how to um, uh, deal with this really complex issue. Um, it is really complex because, um, you know, both things could be argued to be a disability that both need to be accommodated. Um, and so there's some language and guidance on, on how to do that. Um, and I'm certainly not an expert in that uh, that legal uh, language or that formal guidance, but I do know that there are systems in place to minimize the overlap between those two things. So um, ideally, you know, you would uh, maybe put them in different sections, the service dog handler and the individual with the severe allergies um, or, um, you know, do as much as you can to minimize that overlap to protect both individuals um, and, and not prioritize one condition over the other. But it is definitely hard, especially because dog allergies uh, to dander can be really severe. Um, okay, so common myths about service dogs. Um, we talked about breed. Um, and a myth is that only certain breeds can be trained as service dogs. And if you see a small service dog breed, um, it's likely fake. And this is false. 
Um, the ADA does not specify any breed restrictions. They come in all different sizes and breeds. Um, and importantly, the service dog size should just be appropriate to the task they're being trained to perform. So for example, um, a small dog might be appropriate for hearing assistance or for blood sugar detection, um, but will be inadequate to pull a wheelchair and to turn on and off lights, for example. Um, however, just because there is a small dog does not mean that that dog is not trained to perform a really important task for that individual. So be mindful of biases surrounding that. Um, I think that is something that I see the most often when, you know, someone has a small dog um, with them in a grocery store and you tend to think, oh, that's not a real service dog. But that dog could very well be trained to be detecting their blood sugar, to um, be uh, responding to one other medical conditions that's not visible. So it's important to kind of check those biases and realize that all of these dogs um, are, are valid and come in all different types of shapes and sizes. However, regardless of the breed, um, there are qualities that make a good service dog, of course. If they're going in public, they need to be comfortable in a range of public environments. They need to have a calm temperament, um, so no fear or anxiety, uh, and very importantly, no aggression uh, towards people or other animals, and uh, medically and physically sound. So that is pretty much, um, regardless of the breed, um, any of the, the Chihuahuas or Great Danes or Golden Retrievers or Aussies, any type of dog needs to kind of check off these things um, to, to be really comfortable in public environments. So that's important to consider. Another myth is that uh, a real service dog will never bark. Um, that is a myth. Uh, some service dogs are actually trained to bark. For example, a diabetic alert dog can be trained to bark if their handler's blood sugar levels are changing, um, or sometimes if they are responding to a seizure or a medical um, uh, event that they could bark to get attention. However, the dog's barking behavior must be under control and not be excessive. So um, it, it will be clear if the dog barking is, is not um, under control, right? We have a tendency in airports when this type of thing is not under control. And that is when the, the service dog um, would be um, asked to leave if they are being disruptive and if the handler does not have control of their behavior. Then the last myth is that a service dog must always be on a leash. Um, so in general, um, service animals should obey local leash laws, um, especially here on campus and in, in different um, public spaces, but there are exceptions according to the law. So a leash is not required if a service animal cannot perform its task while on a leash or if the handler cannot use a leash or harness to the visibility. And in, if this is happening, the handler still must have control over the animal by their voice, um, hand signals, or effective means if no leash is being used. However, of course, um, almost all service dogs are on a leash or a tether um, or under some sort of a harness. Um, however, it is important that this sometimes is an exception and this is a very valid consideration. Okay, so fraudulent cases. Um, so I'm talking about local laws because we're in Colorado. Um, this is the, the case for many states as well. Um, it's a crime to intentionally misrepresent an assistance or emotional support animal, to avoid pet fees, or to have an animal in housing that otherwise does not allow animals. Um, it's also a crime to falsely impersonate an individual with a disability. And uh, police officers, can afford this law on campus and the state enforces this law. Um, fines can be up to $500 depending on the number of offenses by the same person. So this can happen uh, all across the state and um, a lot of states have implemented these laws because service dog fraud is a really big issue. Um, and mainly because um, trying to you know, pass your pet off as a service animal has implications on the both um, the policy and the human side, but also on for the dog itself. So on the, um, the policy side, um, having, you know, what we call fake service dogs or, you know, pet dogs that are being passed off as a service animal but aren't can hurt the reputation of service animals that are actually needed and also the acceptance and validity of service 
service dogs for people with individual um, disorders, especially those invisible disabilities where the person might look um, like they don't have a disability on the outside, but they do. And it's really important that we try to minimize this so that people that do need service dogs are respected and given um, the, the accommodations that they need in public. Um, Really, public education is key here. Um, it's important um, for individuals that are considering, you know, maybe I'll pass my dog off as a most support animal, you know, or a service animal, um, just to avoid paying that that fee, or you know, to get my dog into uh, this apartment that says no dogs allowed. Um, and it's really important to speak up and say that you know this is a problem. There are people that really need these dogs and um, in, in engaging in fraudulent activity surrounding this is a really big problem. On the dog side, if um, a dog is being taken in public and has not been um, you know, trained and, and socialized around these areas, it could be really stressed out. Um, so having um, a dog in um, a, a public space with you that is having anxiety and stress, um, that's a really big problem for the dog. Um, they don't necessarily um, might not want to be there. And a lot of dogs that are in these fraudulent cases are exhibiting stress behaviors and exhibiting, um, you know, barking or, or different types of things to indicate that, um, you know, this is not my cup of tea. And that's really important for the dogs is, you know, consider um, what the implications are for their well-being as well. Um, and I just wanted to mention that uh, this is a class two petty offense in Colorado state law, but it is more serious than other um, types of in uh, state environments. In California, for example, um, it's a really serious law with um, fines up to $1,000 and actual like three months of jail time as well. Okay, so um, why is this important? Um, so I just wanted to highlight some research that has been done around this area. Um, there was a study done in, in 2017 where um, a large sample of service dog handlers were recruited of all different types of disabilities and, and service dog types, um, so both visible um, and invisible. And um, they asked them, you know, um, in an average day, um, how often and how, uh, how much do you agree with these things happening? Um, so, uh, for example, um, sometimes the legitimacy or need of my service dog in public is questioned by others um, across the board that was tended to be really strongly endorsed. Um, and, and this is something that that fraudulent cases are, are contributing to. Um, it, there should not be this question for those who do really need their service dogs. Um, for example, another question is how often are you asked inappropriate questions when using your service dog in public, such as what is your disability or can I see your paperwork? Uh, a majority of people say that this happens sometimes or often. So this is why public education is so critical for these individuals. Um, one really important thing that this paper found is that um, service dog handlers with invisible Visible disabilities, um, which we talked about, are things that, that might not be really obvious. Um, you know, they're not maybe in a wheelchair or holding a cane, but they still have a disability and their dog is still incredibly important for them. Um, they are more likely to experience discrimination and more likely to be questioned about the legitimacy of their service dog than people with a visible disability. And um, that is a big drawback. Um, and in some cases, people said that the negative social effects of having a service dog and being questioned if they're real and you know having these invasive questions of what's wrong with you why do you need that dog um, can actually sometimes outweigh the benefits of having that assistive um, technology in public so it's it's important we step up as a community as a campus and um, to give these individuals uh, the respect that they need um, and this study really highlights the importance of that Okay, and then just at the end, I wanted to just highlight some uh, policies surrounding emotional support animals. Um, so remember that these are pet dogs um, that are uh, medically prescribed to provide therapeutic benefits through dedicated companionship. Um, and while we talked about how on airlines, we tend to just do dogs and cats now, uh, importantly in housing situations, um, there are still a variety of emotional support animals. 
Um, so on campus, um, in accordance to university policy, again, with accommodations, um, the university does accommodate an individual's need um, for an emotional support animal in campus housing. Uh, CSU defines an emotional support animal as any commonly domesticated animal that provides emotional support or comfort to a person with disability. So um, can be animals other than dogs or cats. Um, the requirements really are that the animal, whatever uh, species it is, can be safely kept, is not vicious, dangerous, or wild, and is legal to possess. Um, and uh, importantly, emotional support animals are only permitted to live with individuals on university-owned housing units, um, and they do not have the access rights that service dogs do. So they can live in university housing. However, they are not allowed to accompany that individual to places like the dining hall or to classrooms. Um, other considerations, um, students that request an emotional support animal for on-camping housing must seek approval. So this is different than the service animals where it's not required by law. Um, this is required. Um, you have to seek accommodation um, through the Disability Center to um, have the emotional support animal in housing. Um, and you have to um, have a mental health professional be able to uh, derive an identical relationship between the disability and the support that the animal provides. Um, so whether that is anxiety relief, um, help with phobias, help with different types of stress, um, and that's really important to provide. Um, however, there's no hard and fast rules here. And um, like a lot of emotional support, uh, cases. It's kind of just on a case-by-case -case basis, and um, the, the short answer is, you know, it depends. Um, landlords have uh, a lot of case-by-case -case basis. Um, universities also um, really case-by-case -case where um, there might be situations that don't fit into like an over-encompassing rule. Um, and the requests have to be supported by a medical professional who has an established relationship with the individual, so has seen them uh, many times over the course of time, ideally, and that can be, you know, anything from a medical doctor, uh, a mental health provider, um, or other qualified professional. Um, and importantly, those certificates and, and ID cards that can be purchased online, and those letters that can be purchased online are not valid. And I just wanted to point out that um, the CSU Health Network has a statement on their website that they typically do not conduct um, evaluations for emotional support animals um, due to a variety of reasons. I encourage you to read their statements on this um, where it basically is um, a matter of expertise. They don't have the expertise to really be able to um, say that this emotional support animal is needed or not, that that really um, is up to um, different types of professionals like forensic psychiatrists um, and individuals in which the, the student has an established relationship with over time. So maybe um, in their hometown, an individual that has been seen by one specific counselor, that is who um, should be making this documentation. Okay, I um, just wanted to end with some resources. Um, so, um, uh, the Disability Center is an incredible resource for all different types of information about service dogs, emotional support animals, and campus storms, campus policies. There's a whole situation protocol that happens um, if you do see a service animal or emotional support animal um, that is uh, disruptive. Um, and there's a lot of FAQs, so check that out. Um, if I didn't go over something today, guaranteed it is here or in the policy. Um, this is a, a beautiful policy that um, is, is available for anyone uh, to read, which also has FAQs and a lot of different things, especially we were talking about um, allergies and, and different types of considerations in classrooms. That is all there. And then I just wanted to um, shout out that a lot of times I get asked, well, you know, maybe my, my child or my cousin or, you know, my friend of a friend is really interested in getting a service dog. Where do they go? And how do, what's the responsible way to go about this if they don't have their own pet dog to train? Um, and I just wanted to uh, put a plug out there for, you know, it's a, it's a buyer's beware market for consumers looking for reputable assistance dog programs. There 
are unfortunately um, scams out there, which are really, really unfortunate um, because it's, it's really hard when you Google this to find, you know, what is a scam and what's real. Um, so just wanted to um, suggest that um, finding an ADI accredited member program is always a really great avenue to go. So this is Assistance Dog International. They are kind of the, the governing agency of, of assistance dogs across the entire world, where um, if you are working with an ADI accredited program, consumers can ensure that the program is meeting the highest standards in the field. Um, so not only in their training and selection for their dogs, but um, their treatment of clients and ethical business practices uh, and so on. So um, ADI accredited programs have defined service areas like geographic locations uh, based on their ability to provide support for their clients. So this is always a great place to start is to um, see what local ADI um, affiliated programs are in your state or in your region and to reach out to them. Um, the biggest drawback, though, is that there are wait lists, and unfortunately, wait lists are long in this field. And uh, again, it's important. Um, I do a lot of research in this area. It's important that we get more resources to them because, uh, unfortunately, there are way too many applicants for the number of dogs and the, and the amount of money that these organizations are able to fundraise and sustain from donations. Um, and so um, a lot of these organizations are absolutely wonderful. I'd recommend um, checking many out. There's some here in Colorado and, and all over the West. And it's a really good place to just start. Um, and what you can do is also reach out to one of these organizations and ask them about other options in your area as well. They're very helpful. So that's just a plug for anyone that had questions about that or has a friend or family member that might be interested in getting a service dog. Um, and then uh, feel free to get in touch with me at any time. Um, here's my email, website, and uh, Twitter.